Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we hear how, in July 1918, the Australian commander, Lieutenant General Monash, led a successful action at La Amel, which was to act as a template for the Battle of Amiens a few weeks later. I'm Hugh Strawn. I'm on the Wolfberg Ridge, on which the Germans had planned their second line of defences at Amel, which was captured by the Australians on the 4th of July 1918, a month before the Battle of Amin. I'm looking west in the distance. You can see the magnificent church of Corby. Corby is on the River Somme. It's on the southern edge of the Somme battlefield, as it was in 1916. Immediately in the foreground, in a valley, is the village of Amel, and looking slightly south, you can just see the top of the Australian memorial at Villas Bretonne, Amel. It's often seen as a model Allied offensive of the sort that was conducted in 1918, but it's also exceptional. Everything went according to plan. It had been very carefully rehearsed, conducted by Sir John Monash, the Australian Corps commander, just recently confirmed in that post and combining arms to an extraordinarily effective extent, tanks, air, infantry. It's also a very easy battle to understand. Unlike many parts of the Somme battlefield, the ground is very clear, particularly when you're in the second German position and looking back towards the west, the direction from which the Australians were attacking. So this is important ground for Australia. It's important ground for the understanding of warfare as it came to be in 1918 and in many ways affected the conduct of war in the Second World War too. This notion that in order to fight an effective modern battle, you need to combine arms and combine arms to the lowest level of formation that you can achieve. So this is fought as a core battle Corps is about 30,000 men, varies a lot, of course, in composition over the course of the war. A corps in 1914 was the principal building block of an army. It combined artillery, infantry, and cavalry. By 1918, a corps contains all those elements, plus aviation, tanks. It tries also to produce that combination of arms down to divisional level, down to brigade level, down to battalion level. Even at the lowest level of formation, to say platoon or section level. So an infantry section now, seven to 10 men, will have its own integrated firepower, its own light machine guns, its own grenades, its own capacity to fight as an independent fire unit, which would not have been the case in 1914. Sir John Monash, the Australian Corps commander, used the vocabulary from music. It's about how you get the individual components of an orchestra to work together. The fact that he was able to achieve his objectives here in just over 90 minutes was one of the reasons why it all held together. You've still got the problem in 1918 of real-time communication between the commander, between Monash, and his component formations something which the commander loses control of from the moment the attack is initiated. And he tries to offset that by rehearsal beforehand, by very careful planning, and by integrating particularly infantry and artillery as best as he possibly can. Provided you set limited objectives within a limited time frame, then there's a real possibility of delivering effect. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the captain speaking. Do apologise uh, for that. Uh, that was a false alarm. That was a false alarm. Um, fortunately, we had a slight electrical error there, uh, but uh, everything is now back to normal. 
My name is Barney Barnes. I am one of the guides on the international tour and also the Army Visiting Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London. And we are on a ferry crossing the Channel. The task of Sir John Monash at the Battle of Hamel was to push the Germans back off the high ground around Hamel, capture Hamel village, in order to straighten the line to enable further attacks later. Now, Monash described fighting a battle as controlling an orchestra. He understood that the essential problems of a First World War battle were first of all closing the space across the floodplain in this instance with as few casualties as possible. Once they had closed that gap to capture the ground but then the most important part, and this was where we had failed continually since 1916, was to hold the ground because the Germans were masters of the counterattack. So you had to arrive at the critical point with sufficient supplies to be able to defend the position once you'd held it. So John Monash was an Australian civil engineer, highly successful, had good links with the Governor General, he was very connected, he was very wealthy. He came from a family of Prussian Jewish immigrants, which made him slightly suspect in the eyes of people like the official Australian historian Charles Bean, and indeed Keith Murdoch, whose son is now an owner of media companies. So John Monash was a highly innovative individual. He decided to use technology to take the place of men in order to get his men across the ground as fast as possible. First of all, he uses a deception plan. He understands that the Germans will be expecting an attack. He knows that he has to destabilize them in some way. One of the ways he chooses to do that is by the use of poison gas. So each day for seven days, he bombards first thing in the morning at the same time with poison gas. This forces the Germans to put their gas hoods on. And in wearing their gas hoods and respirators, they lose situational awareness. They get enormously hot. Water builds up in the glass, which means that you don't see things quite so well. You don't hear things quite so well. You have an iron helmet on your head. So by using gas each morning, for seven days. The Germans are in the belief that gas attack will be the prelude to an attack by the Australians. But on the day, Monash uses smoke. On the previous seven days, it had been a mixture of gas and smoke. On the last day, it was smoke alone. Smoke that his men can breathe through. The Germans automatically have the reaction of reaching for their respirators and gas equipment, which will leave them completely blind in terms of situational awareness, giving an automatic advantage to those advancing infantry. They advanced behind a barrage. However, all of their guns were pre-registered. There was no barrage leading up to it. It was an immediate lightning barrage on the German strong points followed by a barrage in front of the Australian troops who would move forward, supported by tanks. Now, the Australians had not liked the use of tanks. The Australians had had a very bad experience at Bullecourt in April and May 1917. But Monash was convinced that the use of tanks was important, and so they used a large number of tanks, as well as the 600 artillery pieces that were in support. This is how he got across the ground and drove the Germans off. But there are two real innovations. Using the artillery as a barrage, using the tanks to support, and also now using aircraft as ground support. So aircraft from 8th Squadron Royal Air Force would come in and subdue points using their machine guns and bombs. This was how the Germans were pushed off the position so easily. However, one of the most important things is resupplying. And behind that resupply, he had the innovative idea of using tanks with open sides filled with stores. One of those tanks could carry as much stores as 100 men. So those tanks would follow along, get into the positions where the Australians were, on the forward edge facing the Germans, waiting for that counterattack and resupplying them and dropping supplies from aircraft. An idea which had been used in Mesopotamia in 1916 and had gone on and been developed 
by Captain Lawrence Wackett, who would later become an Air Vice Marshal in the Australian Air Force. You would fly over and drop by parachute using a mechanism under the body of the aircraft, ammunition in boxes. Now, the ammunition numbers that he was able to drop were not huge. They dropped 110,000 rounds. But 110,000 rounds of ammunition dropped right into the gun pits of the Australian machine gunners at the right moment could hold up. And indeed, it did hold up that counterattack. So the success of La Hamel is down to the aggression of the Australian troops, to the scientific use of artillery, to the combination of ground and air, and also the resupply. Monash plans the action to be complete in 90 minutes. It's complete in 93, but I think we can forgive him because it is a perfect attack. Aspects of it then go on to be used in the Battle of Amiens on the 8th of August, and indeed, time and time again, throughout the 95 days of the 100-day campaign leading to the armistice. Les points de rassemblement que les passagers doivent rejoindre en cas d'urgence, l'utilisation des gilets de sauvetage et la description du signal d'alarme sonore. Le signal d'alarme est composé de sept clous de sirène bref suivi d'un coup plus long. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we join Professor Sir Hugh Strawn for the last of his morning briefings, when he looks at how the Battle of Amiens triggered a series of Allied offensives that brought the war with Germany to an end just a few months later.